it's uh, Future Library. I keep forgetting the podcast name. As you as you know, every time, if you've listened to all the other 13 episodes, because this is episode 14, if you've listened to all the other 13 episodes, you will know that I regularly forget the title. And the reason being is that I do another podcast called Fundamentally Flawed, which I've done 60-odd episodes with, uh, and I get mixed up between which ones are which. And sometimes I want to say Fundamentally Flawed instead of Future Library. It doesn't help that they've both got Fs, but I've no one to blame but myself. But anyway, hello and welcome to future library uh guest today is fraser simpson fraser is somebody i've known from dundee many many years ago we've known each other for about more than 10 years now isn't it fraser um easy um 1997 yeah yeah so it's a long long time Uh, fraser kind of originated uh he was at university in dundee when i met him uh and was uh playing in numerous bands uh because it was involved in that kind of fertile late 90s early noughties kind of Dundee music scene that's looked back as a kind of classic era of Dundee music. Uh, and it's kind of strange to kind of think of it in that way that, because I did a compilation of Dundee bands and, and Fraser Bun Leto was one of them, and that came out in 2000. So kind of looking back at something that's now 13 years old, that's kind of yeah. back in the past, and you kind of look back and you go, yeah, it's the golden era. But then I suppose people in the music scene at any time see it as the golden era. Uh, but they're wrong, aren't they, Fraser? Yeah. Because ours was the golden era. Yeah, what a surprise that the golden era would occur when I was, like, 20 years old or something like that. What a surprise. <coughs> have, well, I, wonder, I wonder if that's in some way connected. Uh, well, I think I think being in, in, in our 20s is, is linked. Yeah, um, totally. I mean, it's just <laughs> rose-tinted. You know. um, yeah, I mean, I, I liked it. It was a good time. Um, it was um, for, for a number of reasons. Um for you know being young and being at uni and sort of you know having our own responsibilities and sort of being in bands and being uh, I suppose part of some sort of scene and stuff like that it was all um it was all really good but you know I don't know necessarily if that's entirely down to Dundee just having a special time uh, during that period or or that's seeming like that to me because I was involved you see, I can have, uh, having spoken to a few people, um, <coughs> excuse me, a few people over the, the last year on the podcast who mm-hmm. were involved in the Dundee scene, there mm-hmm. seems to be a general feeling that there was something special at that time. Uh, but I think, I think it could have then lulled off a little bit, and a lot of people have said that it could have lulled towards the second half of, of the noughties, and it's starting to really pick up again now, which is yeah. know, nice to know about. But <clears throat> uh, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, yeah. Fraser, you should tell us a bit about yourself. Obviously, as I said, I knew you from Dundee, but give us a bit of your background and and your where, how you've got to where you are now and where you are now. <laughs> um, I, I'm in my living room um, in Brighton, um, and I got here starting in... Um, Actually, it's not. The two things aren't really related, kind of. Um, um, I knew Alex from... We, I played in a previous band with my pal, Robbie, called um, Kid Nothing. That was sort of... That I definitely look back on as sort of a, something embarrassing now. Oh, you but, shouldn't. Um, That's the thing. Well, you, shouldn't. you should never be embarrassed about your past. Well... <laughs> it was quite I, placebo-esque, I the band. It was, but... it was a bit. But it kind of went in sort of... Towards the end, it sort of went in kind of like sort of shudder to think directions or something like that, like sort of a wee bit, a wee bit weirder, and um, started listening to weirder music and stuff. And um, anyway, um, so from at the end of that, um, I started playing with my two other, yeah, a guy I met through skateboarding called Andrew um, and his pal from school called Kevin. And we made this band called Leto that was sort of, I suppose, started off as something of a something of a post rock band around sort of late ninety seven and started playing gigs in early ninety eight. Um and yeah, that was kind of sort of I, I suppose like lots of other post rock bands at the time was sort of a bit like Mogwai and a bit like Tortoise and stuff and we sort of I suppose we saw ourselves as a bit kind of trying to be like Rodan or something like that. And then that that band kind of morphed into more like sort of just um, being less po-faced about it. Um, And, you know, um, 
trying to be less hard, like still being weird, but trying to do stuff like Thin Lizzy and stuff like that, and Van Halen and stuff like that as well, which, you know, was good to me. That's when it got really good. And at the same time, that's when it got kind of less popular, um, you know, and, and that's fine by me, you know. Um, yeah, because the popularity but, thing, I mean, you guys are doing kind of towards the, the tail end of the kind of post-rock era of late. Mm. I mean, you were doing things like supporting Idlewild on tour and yeah. playing with Snow Patrol and various things. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it's a, it's a shame that the subsequent music, which, you know, was starting to really kind of stamp your own identity on it, mm. sort of maybe kind of people didn't get as much. But Yeah, I mean, you know, it was pretty... Um, like, I'm not going to say it's ahead of its time or anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to say was... it's ahead of its time, you can no, say it. No, 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 not at all. I think it was kind of far, I, I don't know, um, I don't know, behind its time probably. Um, I don't know. It was just wonkier music and it kind of wasn't, it wasn't very cool, you know, and I mean that in the, you know, the most, the most honest sense, you know, I'm not like one of those, like one of those things where you see Duran Duran on breakfast TV and they're like, yeah, for a while, like, we're kind of not very cool and that's a good thing because that makes the, the kids really, um, really into us because like we're an alternative and stuff, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to paint this as like a, it just got kind of not very, um, I don't know. I, I thought it was great um, towards the end. Um, we did we did some big stuff towards the end. We did like that once that Snow Patrol album um, final straw got really big and they'd sold like millions of copies. We kind of got asked to go on tour with them and stuff like that and went out and that was just ridiculous, you know, like thousands of people. Um, how, did, three, how did you go down with, I mean, because a little bit of background for the listeners, Snow Patrol started out in the same kind of scene, maybe a year or so ahead of everybody yeah. else. Uh, and they were at uh, Dundee University and were called Polar Bear to start with. And mm. You actually played guitar on their first album, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I played a few gigs with them for a while and stuff like that, yeah. but I just kind of didn't. So, but didn't stick. Back in the day, <clears throat> they were they, when they first really started out. They kind of very much sounded like a Sebado tribute band. Yeah, and I remember they were known kind of. Uh, I don't know if they were ever known to their faces around Dundee, but I know that they were known kind of in conversation as Snowbado. That was uh, this is true, right? That was my dad that invented that. Your dad invented Snowbado. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which. <laughs> Which is great, like, because we had, um, like, I don't know, um, like, my dad, my dad was always quite, my dad always used to come and see us a lot. I reckon my dad came to see us, like, I, I tried to count it once, and it was, I, I reckon it was something like 90 times, like, my dad had been. Um, and, he, you know, he was just genu- genuinely enthusiastic about any bands I'd been in and stuff like that, and sort of, you know, he'd hear me talking about things, and I'd go home and, you know, I'd go home for the weekend from uni and go, you know, go to get some of my dad's CDs to put on and looking through his CDs and I found once I found Tweez by Slint in there and I was and I'm like what you know how and he just bought it because he'd heard me talking about it and stuff anyway so so um what do you call it Sebado was kind of the same thing like my dad yeah. my dad had heard Sebado and stuff like that and liked it and we I can't remember we had, I had like a snow patrol tape on in the car or something like that and my dad said is this Sebado and I said, no, it's Snow Patrol. And he went, oh, my God. And I went, yeah. And he said, yeah, they should be called Snowbado. Nice. And and I told I told um, Kieran Malott, one of the promoters that put Snow Patrol on, um, he put them on all the time in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and he put the, you know, on the stage times thing that's yeah. backstage that says, you know, so it said, like, late or 9 o'clock to 9.45, Snowbado, <laughs> um, 10 o'clock to, uh, yeah. So Gary was like... When he sort of cornered my dad one night and said, "I want a word with you," <laughs> that was really good. So I think yeah, because they could have mutated from that, which they kind of yeah. fitted in in the kind of local Dundee scene and the Scottish scene as a whole at the time, and they could have slowly mutated into what then became known as uh, Snowplay, uh, as they became more Coldplay esque. Uh, so uh, you were yeah. playing with them when they started to kind of that that tour you did with them. Uh, they were on the kind of turning into the kind of Coldplay band that we know them as now. Yeah. Um, so that- how did how did Leto go down with their fan base um oddly i think <laughs> um uh, well i mean i enjoyed it and people were nice i mean we we played we played two nights at the manchester apollo um and um the 
that was full both nights. And as far as I know, that holds like 3,000 people, that place, right? Um, and it was full for us coming on, which is really nice. You know, that's a really good thing for, you know, a big popular mainstream band for their audience to get there early and watch support bands. And that was really good. And it's, you know, endeared Manchester to me forever. Um, but um, f- for <laughs> 3,000 people watching us and, you know, being very graciously enthusiastic after every song we sold in two nights there, we sold no T-shirts um, and no albums. So if, if that's any indication of how we went down with their, their crowd, then there you go. But it was fun to do. It was, you know, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. You also played the Caird Hall as part of the uh, yeah. thing that, uh, I think it was it Rachel, the music development officer, organised. Uh, yeah. was that, that big push when Dundee City Council, yeah, around yeah. the turn of the millennium, got really into kind of promoting the local music scene. Yeah. And it resulted in this kind of load of events, a kind of uh, a manual thing coming out. Oh, it was a kind of directory, wasn't it, that had all the mm. bands and artists and everybody listed. Uh and it was it was an amazing thing for the council to do. It yeah, was a yeah. really forward thinking thing, and it resulted in you guys playing. I think it was with Idlewild and uh, Gerald's, Gerald's, wasn't it? Yeah. <coughs> Gerald's, such a fantastic band. Yeah, um, I hear that their singer got, a, or somebody was with them, got a little bit Larry backstage or something. From what I hear on that night, uh, there was a little bit of tension from one of their kind of uh, hangers on. But yeah, I can't, I can't remember, to be honest. Um, I think it was I, John, because we, cause it's actually kind of a weird link, because um, the reason that I know you is through Robbie. Yeah. And Robbie I know because he played drums in a couple of bands I was in as well. Uh, it's always the way with drummers, isn't it, that they end up mm. being in multiple bands. Yeah, hubs. So, so yeah, so Robbie was in uh, Neurola, that was the very yeah. brief lasting band that I was in with Susan from Stereo Bus, mm-hmm. uh, and then he was briefly in uh, Magnetic North Pole for like the first couple of gigs and the yeah. the split single we did. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I was briefly in Lato for uh, two gigs yeah. playing bass. Uh, everybody got kind of passed around, <laughs> didn't they? And then the link with Gerald's is that then Robbie was p- replaced in Magnetic North Pole by John from Gerald's who then ended up being almost everything. And then, I remember, you played in Magnetic North Pole as well. Yeah, that's right. I played, played drums at a gig, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, you played I drums at our last ever show. That's right. And I completely forgot about that. I just remembered, we were both in the Shit Boys. That's right. We played that show supporting, was it Peeps into Fairyland? Yeah, and I had, I played drums with all of my clothes on. Like <laughs> at, all of your clothes on? All, all of my clothes on, yeah. And didn't you say so your name was Sock? Something I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. I seem to remember, remember we, made, had... we made all the songs up as we went along. Yeah, that's right. And I had a plastic bag on my head. Yeah, and yeah, we changed yeah. the name of the band at each song. We asked the audience what we should be called for each song. Yeah. Uh, and we asked the audience what the song should be called, and then we'd play the song, and then we'd do the next one. I remember you playing the drums, getting up and walking around the kit and still playing. <laughs> Yeah, what a great idea. That was a fun night. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's how... That we've, uh, we've got, I've completely forgotten how we got to that bit. Yeah, but, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, yeah, you played the Ked Hall with them, and so you'd done kind of the big shows with, with Snow Patrol. And so was it feeling at the time that, you know, this is the beginning of it kind of snowballing, or was there already a feeling of, no, like, people no. aren't interested? Um. <sighs> I think we got to, I think the first couple of years, um, you know, it's just sort of after the first album and stuff like that, um, which was, that came out in early 2000, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, so that was recorded late 99 and came out March 2000, I think. And there was a, a I kind of felt like a bit, so I would, how old had I been? I would have been 22. Yeah. Um, and I was like, right, well, you know, this is it. You know, um, I'm. You know, this is this is going to. You know, while it, I don't think we ever thought like this is we we're going to be. You know, like famous rock stars or anything. But certainly, like our goal at the time was well, maybe we could do this and not have to, not have to work for five years, like sort of quit uni and go and and go and you know uh, play shows and tour and go and see America and go and see Japan and stuff like that. And we thought, you know, there's a possibility that that might happen. Um, and, you know, at that time we were get, you know, I was, Robbie and I were, um, Robbie and I had the flat together um, and we were getting quite a lot of, um, 
quite a lot of phone calls from you know labels all the time and stuff like that and sort of interest and and, and it, you know I didn't realise that ha- that happens to lots of bands you know that's just that's just what A and R people's job is so at the time well, I mean I don't know if that's the case now actually but certainly at that time that was kind of what happened I think it? well it was it was I think and again I think it comes back to also the bands in Dundee at that time, there were a lot of really good bands because mm. a lot of us were getting those fun, kind of phone calls. Yeah, uh, totally. You know, there was you guys, there was uh, Mercury Tilt Switch were in the same kind yeah. of situation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Magnetic North Pole had little bits of people kind of sniffing around. Mm-hmm. Various other people had stuff going on. Gerald's had people kind of... Gerald's were a brilliant example of a band that had that that continually shot themselves in the foot over it by just refusing to do things. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a kind of feeling that this little scene was... On the cusp of kind of becoming something more, uh, and I think yeah. we all could have like started to get kind of laissez faire about it, going, "Oh yeah, you know, we're we're all special because we're the we're the team." But yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, I think very quickly we sort of realised that you know nothing's going to happen here, you know, and this is it, and you know, and and that was, and to be honest, I think that's the turning point where our our band got better. We started kind of doing, you know, just whatever we liked and doing stupid stuff that was, you know, that was funny or something like that, just because we thought it was funny or something, you know. Um, and around about that time, we started practicing at the Grey Lodge as well, um, yeah. and which is this sort of kind of slightly odd sort of community centre in, um, in the hill town in Dundee. Was it the downstairs, um, was it the weird yeah. downstairs room you are in with the yeah. former recording booth? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We used to rehearse in there as that, well. That, yeah, totally. Well, that, that was how we found out about it, actually, because Robbie had rehearsed there with, um, um, with uh, Neurola a couple of times. Um, so we got in there and tried, you know, I, I think for a while we were the only band there and that was really liberating because... You know, I mean, we were we were quite serious about our band, so you know, we were all very, you know, I don't know, all very sort of like super serious and enthusiastic, and you know, um, uh, we we used to practice all day Saturday and all day Sunday, um, like every week, yeah. um, and that things just kind of evolved really quickly. Then once we went, you know, sort of paying for a, a rehearsal room at Stage Two Thousand for, which is a rehearsal room in Dundee that everybody used, we went paying, you know, thirty quid for or whatever it was. I can't remember for um, for three hours in there. We were just like, you know, we could go in, set our stuff up. Um, go upstairs and have a cup of tea. Go and get lunch and come back. And, and you know, it was it was more like, sort of like um, being in a, a studio in the seventies or something, where you had like a month to work your stuff out or something. And you know, so that's kind of what we did, and that that was where it got really liberating. And I think that you know, we were kind of much less aware of the we were kind of shut in that little space for ages and much less aware of what you know, kind of what what was happening in places like Glasgow and stuff like that, you know, so we we were just, we were just played and sort of got, at the same time as, same time as that was happening, like people would come to see us less and less in Glasgow and we just, just sort of stopped playing Glasgow really and started playing Edinburgh a lot more um, and, you know, playing Dundee sort of, I don't know, once a month or once every couple of months or something like that and, and then it sort, it sort of petered out where we did stuff a lot less, but um, but we were kind of still really serious about it. I moved to Edinburgh um, and worked down there for a couple of years. So in answer to the question you asked like 20 minutes ago or something, <laughs> um, I, um, I'd gone to... I'd, I was at uni. Um, I left uni um, because... You know, it was like, oh, I'm in, you know, I'm in a band that's doing well and stuff like that. And, yeah, because you, you, you were studying architecture or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah. a long course as well, isn't it? It's like mm. seven years or something crazy. Yeah, so I was in like my third and a half year or something and just kind of went, right, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think it wasn't really for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I left, um, worked in a call centre, <clears throat> worked in a call centre for a wee bit, um, went to got fed up with that obviously um went to college um at perth to do audio engineering um and then sort of did um did some you know sort of live sound for a bit and then kind of 
you know, there just wasn't any money in it. I was getting sort of 15 quid a couple of nights a week or something like that and thought I needed a job. And we were at the student union in Dundee and there was a, a job for a video games tester um, in Dunfermline. And I thought, that sounds interesting. Um, and I applied for it and got it. Um, and, that, and I've been working in video games for sort of 12 years, 11 years or something now. Um, so, yeah, that was... I worked in Dunfermline there for a bit and then that at Vids and then I was as a tester and moved down to Edinburgh um, and then eventually Viz got um, Viz uh, went down um, and the game we were working on um, and this is like 2004 or 2005 I think um, went um, got bought over by a company called DC Studios who opened again in the same offices and that's when I moved into design like video game design mm-hmm. Um and eventually DC went down and I was applying for jobs round about all over the place. Um, couldn't really get anything. And um, the um, one job come up doing a, a designing a game for Sega in Brighton on a four-month contract. And that was seven years ago. Nice. So, um, so I've, been, I've been in Brighton or living in Brighton ever since and doing sort of... Um, you know, game design down here and eventually sort of moving into kind of lead design and sort of leading the design of a project, if you like, um, and uh, doing that. So, and that, yeah, that finally ended up with you uh, finally in uh, the NME, I believe. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, the Yeah, despite, you know, numerous attempts to, you know, so, sort of phone... K Empire at the NME offices and say, can you do a feature on us like we're a new band? And her going, no, well, I don't know. There's lots of, this is really complex and we'd love to do one, but we just we just can't just now and stuff like that or whatever the reason was, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I got interviewed for the NME a couple a couple of months ago for a um, for a, a game that we did and. In conjunction with, or in sort of in collaboration with Snoop Dogg, um, so yeah, there you go. Yeah, because some of the guys who were working on that flew, didn't they? Fly out to LA or something to record yeah. with Snoop Dogg or something. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, they were out there doing VO. So the sort of creative director of the company was like, um, he'd written all the all the story and stuff, and got to go out and tell tell Snoop Dogg, you know, that he had to. He had to pronounce sword correctly and not say sword and stuff <laughs> like that. So, so do you find? I mean, obviously, I think I'm guessing the kind of the security of what you're doing is probably good. But which do you prefer doing? If you if you can be completely kind of honest now, which do you prefer doing the what you're doing now or doing the music side of things? Or, um, do you, or would you like to have a balance between the two? Well, I, I, I'd like to think that I do have a balance between yeah. the two. I mean, I still, I still mess around with music. You know, we've got a, um, we've got a little home studio that we've sort of built up in the flat, and we just kind of mess around. And um, I make things, and I'm, I'm, nobody ever hears any of it because I'm really good at starting things and really bad at finishing things, uh, at least where music's concerned. But um, I, I like both of them. Um, Making games is, uh, I mean, I, I like my job a lot and I care about it quite a lot and I care about game design quite a lot. I think it's an important thing um, now. Um, and, you know, um, but it is sort of product design in a way. You're, you're sort of, you're, you have your audience in mind. If you're a game designer who doesn't care about your audience, you're probably a bad game designer, I think, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know, generally speaking. Uh, you, you know, the games are games are functionally usable things, and they have to work correctly before you can. There is artistry in it, but it has to be a functional thing. Whereas music is just this thing that's always kind of been, you know, since since not since I started in in games actually, but since after that first couple of years and later, where it was like we we realised it wasn't going to go anywhere. Then it it kind of became just a hobby, and that that. You know, um, I talk to people about this, and you know, some some people. Um, my girlfriend Rachel was a musician as well, and she will sort of object to the use of the word hobby sometimes. But I I don't see it as a bad thing. It's like you know, it's just not how I pay the rent, and you know, but I still do it. And I think 
I think most artists, whatever you're involved with, I'm not saying I'm an artist, but certainly I would, you know, um, I'd like to think that I'm involved in the creation of something that's purely creative, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, most people would do that as a as a hobby, whether or not they were getting paid to do it, if yeah. they're, if they're serious about it. Um, I so th- I think it's one of these. I mean, something was mentioned a couple of podcasts back was I was talking about kind of young bands in Birmingham because I'd had a, a kind of Twitter run in with some kind of twenty somethings, and it kind of it that surprises me. Alex. Well, it was, very, it was really <laughs> weird because you see, the thing is, for the last ten years or so, I've actually been quite kind of placid with these things, <laughs> and <laughs> I've kind of got past the kind of you know I look back and I go. God, I was a right dick to people in the past. I was very argumentative. Uh, but I kind of like briefly got into this Twitter spat with these kind of like young kind of guitar bands in Birmingham. And I just kind of had this flashback to the late 90s jock rock kind of era. And I thought, oh, Jesus, nothing's changed. Uh, but they were all kind of saying, oh, you know, look at you, old man, you're not successful, you've not done anything, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of came away from it thinking, well, as far as I'm concerned, that if you're still doing it, and still enjoying it, then you've succeeded at it. You know, it doesn't mean you've got to sell tons of records. If you're yeah. still able to do it on your own terms, then that's fine. Well, you know, it, it, there's a big sort of kind of question. For, well, it's not really a question. There's a people's definition of success is a, a, a really, you know, a sort of a strange one. You know, the people will say to me, um, you know, if we get if we get into a conversation or whatever where I'm like, I used to be in a band, and they go, oh, are you are you successful? And I go, well, you know, well, we were really good, you know. Yeah. And that's that was that was the point. So, yes, it was a successful yes. endeavour, you know. We got good, and that's, you know, you don't, I don't know. I mean, we weren't professionals, you know. We didn't end up only doing that. But, you know, if you measure something by its popularity, then McDonald's is the best restaurant in the world, you know. Um, I, you know, I quite like McDonald's, but um, but um, you know. No, I know exactly what you're saying. I think it's a case of I think people tend to mistake popularity for success. Yeah, and I think, like I said, if you're doing things that you enjoy and you're doing it under your own uh, under, under 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 what you think is right, and if you if you feel satisfied with the work, and you can go back and look at your body of work and go, that is a, a piece of work that I'm proud of yeah and you can look back over you know many years of a lot of work and go this as a body of work is sizable and I'm proud of it and we've done these things then I think that is a success and I think a lot of the, you know mm-hmm. a lot of young bands that that kick around you know there were I mean there were a lot of bands around when we were in Dundee that they vanished and I don't know where any of the people are yeah and they've all disappeared but yeah. there's, there's that kind of the core of the people who were kind of really obviously into it kind of are still all in touch with each other and yeah. still kind of are aware of what everybody's doing and are aware that everybody's still creating things. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I think that's a good thing. And I think, you can t- I think those are the people who have, who have succeeded because they're still doing it. Yeah, yeah and th- these, you know, these people all still make things as well. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, I don't really, really, really release music anymore. I, I, you know, I, and I sort of intend to, and I've always intended to. I just kind of never get round to it. Um, but you know, but I still make things. You know, yeah. I'm still interested. In, and you know, I, I, me and Kevin, um, Kevin Black, um, from who was in Little, but so who plays in Fat Goth now. Um, um, you know, me and Kevin talk all the time on the internet. You know. Yeah. We, just we're both on Skype while we're working and you know I think we're, we were talking about this recently you know about how music's important and I love it and everything yeah. but you know it's kind of it's kind of a tool you know and it's it's what you know what the people making it are, are like that's important you know mm-hmm. uh, it, you know I I took up photography a while ago. Um, I like writing. I make video games, and I think there's a you know I just want to make stuff and put it out. And there's there's a lot of other people that you know that that I know who were involved in that scene. You know who who do the same things or or any scene for that matter. You know, yeah. creative people will continue to be creative. You know, Absolutely. you can you know you're putting this podcast together you know for example and your other podcast that you do like that's because you want to make things and put them out there right and see what happens yeah if you almost become yeah. kind of just continually driven to do it i mean i i can't imagine ever stopping doing creative yeah. things you know i'm still doing visual art i'm still doing music yeah totally. uh, 
you know, I've, I've hit the point where I'm probably more prolific musically than I've ever been. You know, last year I churned yeah. out something like 40 odd releases. It's ridiculous yeah. amount. Nobody listens to it, but you know, fuck it. It's there. Yeah. So, you know, my attitude is, and I, I think this similar thing for a lot of artists is that, and, in, and I think also I have to say, when you were saying you wouldn't class yourself as an artist, I think I would class you as an artist because I think what you do is art. So when I say this, I include you in this. I think, you know, a lot of artists, uh, you have a choice in life you can either leave nothing behind when you're gone or you can you know leave a body of work that your offspring and their offspring and stuff can go yeah. back and go what did my great grandfather do holy fuck here's a load of what he did yeah you know i know what this person was about because i've got you know his whole life laid out here yeah totally you know well, you, you know, can either choose to just disappear or you can leave something behind that's worthwhile yeah, I mean, I don't know. Just what else are you going to do? Yeah, you know, and that and that's part of, you know, I I, I used to be sort of really kind of ethical about music. You know, I, I you know I was really into Fugazi and really into DIY and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And you know, I used to be really kind of ethical about it. And, and you know, it, it's not that's not such a big deal to me anymore. But in some ways, I've become, you know, kind of more ethical about it when people are arguing about you know whether whether they can. You know, I, maybe I can't continue to do this if people are going to continue stealing my records, or if Spotify is going to continue. Or, you know, if I'm expected yeah. um, to release music for people to listen to for nothing, then maybe I won't be able to continue doing this. You know, and I, I don't know. I've uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought, but I can't remember what we were talking about. Well, I mean, I was um, I would, I would say with that whole thing with people, you know, saying that they're not going to do things if they're not making any money out of it. Um, I can understand that argument from some points of view, but also the, the, the tools to create the music has dropped. And I think yeah. doing it for the love of it is the important thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, well, that's what, that's what I was going to say, yeah. Alex. It's not just th- this thing where people are like, um, I can't, you know, I can't do this if, if, you know, if there's no, if there's no incentive or light at the end of the tunnel or, you know, um, fame or whatever at the end of the tunnel, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, I don't think most of the people I know aren't doing this because they, you know, myself included, aren't doing this because, you know, it's all about the music, man, and I just love music so much. They're just making things because what else are you going to do, you know? Yeah. Like, that's the only, you know, that's the only the only way you can sort of give something of yourself into the into the world and leave something, like you said, there for people to, for people to notice. And, you know, everybody wants to be heard in a way, you know, um, and... You know, some more literally than others, yeah. um, and I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm frightened of, you know, kind of not being here. I want to sort of make the most of having been here, and that, yeah. that just means I want to make things and, and see how people react to them. Really, yeah. just, just, you know, as a way to sort of, so that it seems like, you know, this is worth something. You know, like in, in the minute. You know, me going, yeah, some, you know, people are paying attention, people are noticing, people are talking about something I did, and that's good. That makes me feel like I'm, you know, uh, not important, but, you know, alive here. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, that's part of the reason why the podcast is called Future Library, because yeah. I kind of see it as a way of, uh, of, of journaling these things that have happened and archiving these things so that in the future people have got a source to go back to and it might only be one person in a hundred years time might be interested yeah. and find information that's still around and i think it's important to kind of you know because you know i come at it also from the point of view of being a, a, a strict atheist i there's as far as i'm concerned there's nothing after we die and this is yeah. the only time we get and i think it's important to with the realization of that, along with the horror that that kind of entails, when you realize yeah. that you only have the one shot, and you, you know that does lead to moments of existential horror and kind of yeah, point, absolutely, like, Jesus, yeah. I'm not going to be here. But at the same time, you think, well, what can I do with what time I've got? And what you were saying about, you know, what else are you going to do but create? I think yeah. that's a mindset that only people who are creative understand. I think, I think we feel that way because that's how we are, and. I've I've felt exactly the same in the past. I've actually had times when I thought I just want to stop because there's so much stuff around it that just stresses me out. But then yeah. I, I literally can't stop doing it. There's n- there's nothing that I could do to stop myself from doing it. And from your, what you're saying, it sounds like you're in exactly the same situation. And I think the people who uh, yeah them- sort of I'm I'm really lazy as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I find it difficult to I you know I've got 
I've got a to-do list on Google Drive that's just full of stuff that I think is great. There's like music or ideas for, you know, ideas for articles that I'm going to write or whatever, or I just, I don't know, and, you know, none of it ever happens. But that, you know, but to me, that's kind of the important bit, is that having the idea and going, yeah, that's a great idea, I'm going to write that down, you know, and then it's the next thing, you know, that that's, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just I just enjoy it, really, you know, and I don't know. Um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop in to, to because I'm gonna gonna go for a slight kind of change of tack in a moment. But I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna drop in an emergency question. Okay. Uh, let's see which one should we go for. You've got two bullets. Oh no, you've got one bullet. In fact, who do you shoot? Uh, the CEO of a generic corporation or the sax player from the song Baker Street? Um. So harmful CEO or sax player from Baker Street. I quite like Baker Street. See, I um, hate it. <laughs> so I'm going to guess you're going to go with yeah. generic CEO. I, th- I think there's there's something there in Baker Street that I've... Maybe this isn't true, but I feel like I sort of know someone who knows something, someone who knows someone who knows that guy or something. I can't... <laughs> I, maybe that's not Maybe that's not true. Um, oh, I we can't, can't shoot him, and that's, that's a yeah. fine answer. Um, uh, but yeah, so... Um, I don't know. Um, so yeah, the CEO of a generic corporation, I suppose. Although I'm not, you know, I'm not only through, only through force under yeah. duress. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not kind of uh, advocating violence against anybody. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, the reason I brought that, the reason I kind of did that, was because also on my list of of questions, the, the emergency questions, was actually one I wrote at the end, which isn't an emergency question, and it's one to do with computer gaming. And I wanted to get your opinion on uh, on this. How do you feel about the the current kind of leaning towards kind of freemium games, where you know you've got the game for nothing and you're then paying for content within it versus paying for a game that then is yours entirely to do with as you wish? Well, that that depends on a number of things, but there. Um, I mean, first of all, freemium is just what's happening, right? Mm-hmm. That's it's exactly the same as the music industry becoming you know, uh, becoming somewhat redundant and people just expecting to get music for free or a tenner a month on Spotify, you know, people can either complain about it or they can, you know, the, the whole thing with all this, I, I've heard a really good quote a while ago that said, you know, if if the river is rising, you can stand and shout at it or you can move to higher ground, you know, and I think that's that, that sort of rings true with the music industry and with freemium, like that... Freemium is the way that the majority of games is, are, are going now. You know, th- there's there's definitely stuff in console which is not going to which is not going to change, and it's just going to stay the sort of standard business model. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, lots of games are going to you know, lots of those console games, the traditional things are going to roll in like sort of um, in app purchases and stuff like that, and you know, sort of almost kind of freemium models. Um, a- anyway, there's. So there's a couple of things here. There's like um, there's whether the design of a game is completely um, focused on extracting money from a player, mm. or whether a game is saying, okay, well the game's got to be good um, in order to keep people playing. Um, and really, what we want to do, is, what we're doing, is we're understanding that this that people don't want to play. Um, People don't want to pay, you know, even six, seven quid or whatever, or three or four quid for an iPhone game or something um, up front. They want to play for free because that's the established model, right? Yeah. So, so when when people, um, um, you can approach the design of a game like that and saying, you know, this is just how people are going to pay for the game, and we still need to get the, you know, the three or four pounds out of the player. Yeah. Um, so we need to keep them playing. But the game's got to be good, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to keep them playing. And it's just like a coin-op or whatever back in the old days where, where people, you know, people just put in 20 pence every time they get to a boss and they don't beat it and they put in another 20p for another th- another three lives and then go again. You know, um, you can... You can approach the design of it that way, or you can approach the design of it in a really mercenary way, where you are you are putting in as many paywalls and as many hooks as possible to try and get someone, to try and get as much money from the player as possible, and that you know, and a lot of people, um, a lot of people try and you know, like they'll put. Um, too many currencies in their game and stuff like that, and hope that um, hope that maybe people 
get confused and that will confuse them into spending money or something like that. You can get a really good example recently um, was um, a colleague of mine that I work with, um, his daughter accidentally bought a, a 60, um, 60 quid and up purchase on her um, on his, um, his mother-in-law's phone. Um, and when he was talking to her about it, he was saying, well, why did you do this? And she said, I don't know. And he was like, but that's a lot of money. And she said, well, it said, it said 60 GBP. And I, and I didn't know what that meant, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, being cynical with my cynical hat on, you know, I'm sort of imagining that, that that was deliberate, you know, yeah. and maybe it wasn't, but, you know, designing those in that sort of mercenary way is, you know, it, it's it's definitely sort of manipulative. Um, I'd I'd prefer to say you know, I prefer to approach it like, you know, we're making a game. It still costs money to make a game. Um, it's, making games is really expensive. Like, it's a really really expensive thing to do, um, and people need to be paid for. Um, so, and it's a really it's a really difficult and dangerous thing to do as well because there aren't many industries where um, you can have you know, maybe, you know, up to, this wouldn't be on a free-to-play game, for example, but the, you know, the last game I worked on was like a hundred people working for, you know, at least the whole time I was there was a year and a half. And that's, you know, you've generated a, a huge amount of um, wages and, you know, license fees and stuff like that just to keep people in seats for that long. You know, it, and it would, you know, if you imagine going on Dragon's Den or something and saying, okay, we need a hundred million pounds to make a game and it's going to take five years and maybe it'll break even. Yeah. You know, no, that, that seems like a crazy, a crazy thing to invest in, you know. So it's, it's a big and dangerous thing. Um, and some games need, you know, they need to be paid for. Well, all games need to be paid for. They need to get the money somehow. And if if you make a good game first, and you're like, okay, this is this is good. Here are the points where we're going to ask people for money. Um, you know, and if they're enjoying it, maybe they'll pay to play more. You know, then I, I think that's fair enough. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, the kind of example you gave of it being like the coin op thing. Um, yeah, I think that seems kind of like the principled way of getting people to pay for things because it's you know you can you could theoretically go through the whole game for free or on your initial kind of outlay if you're very skilled at it and willing to put the time. Yeah. But if you want to kind of take the shortcuts, you can put the money in. I think it's yeah. when you get things. I mean, and I think uh, EA are particularly guilty of this on their uh, iOS games. Uh, the endless amounts of kind of it almost becomes unplayable if you don't. Uh, put the money in. It's like, uh, like I have Tetris Blitz on my iPhone, right. and I find that game. Uh, I kind of, you know, you give, you get a little two-minute burst of playing, and then I deliberately then don't play it for hours at a time. Yeah. You kind of save up coins to be able to then continue playing it. Yeah, and it's like. You know, I could have find. I feel it's like they've put a barrier in the way to me playing the game because what they want me to do is spend money on coins to then buy power ups to be able to play the game. And yeah. I find, I think that, I mean, I can, you know, can technically continue playing it without any of those things and not spending any coins at all. But they've also then weighted the scoring in the game so that you then earn fuck all points uh, for doing that. So you've got this kind of like slight kind of carrot and stick thing with it that. You know, if you get the power ups and various things, you'll score eight hundred thousand if you're really good on one layer on yeah. one level. If you don't, you've got like seventeen thousand as your score, and you kind of think, oh, I've played just as well. What's going on? And there doesn't seem to even be a transparency in how the scoring works or anything. So I think that kind of play is kind of sneaky. And I think yeah, the in-app purchases where they'll offer things like on the Simpsons tapped out, you know, seventy quid for donuts to then be able to buy virtual buildings. It's, yeah. It's uh, especially when it's games that are aimed at kids. I think there's a yeah. I mean, yeah. There's there's an amount of there's you know some some games you know not not the not the sort of big the big guys the big players. Um, and when I say players, I don't mean games players. I mean you know like the EAs and Zingas yeah. of the world. Um, can well, won't really do this, but um, well they won't do this. But you know some some other games developers are quite cynically you know will. Um, you know, aim things at kids and then try to monetize really, really quickly. You know, just, you know, give, showing kids something and then saying, okay, well, this is, this is a pound. Do you want to buy it? And then, you know, cause kids will just press yes on their parents' iPad or whatever. And, you know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's just manipulative, you know, yeah. um, but uh, by the same token, right? Um, 
Video games is a big industry, and, yeah. and anyone who thinks that video games has suddenly turned the corner and now wants to make money out of people um, has their head in the sand. You know, like video games has been making a lot of money out of a lot of people for a long time. You know, um, and you know, and the way that's structured does that some people make a lot of money, and some, and you know, and people like myself make a you know make a living from it. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, and. You know, psych- psychology and sort of uh, uh, appealing to people and sort of finding out what, um, you know, what's going to keep players playing for longer and stuff like that is it has always been a part of the industry. You know, people have always done that, um, and we've, you know, we've always put content in games. We've always put tons of explosions in things and stuff like that mm-hmm. because because that's what makes people. That's what makes people on blogs and YouTube go fucking hell. That just exploded in my face, you know. And that, and you know, and that's that's good for scores and that's good for business, you know. Um, and that that's why lots of these things happen, you know. Um, that's why Assassin's Creed is, you know. Well, I, I mean, I, I really I really like Assassin's Creed too, um, especially. Um, uh, Brotherhood. I thought it was great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, there was they sort of started rolling in loads of sort of different game mechanics from different genres and stuff like that. And you know, and tower defense stuff and uh, and Assassin's Creed, um, the final part of Two Revelations or whatever, mm-hmm. um, had that in, and it just kind of didn't work. And it felt to me like there was a lot of you know, just rolling in little bits of this and little bits of that to be all things to all people. And, it, you know, it, if, the, if the question is, uh, uh, will you end up with a better thing that people enjoy more if you just if you just try and make something good? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly... I mean, the, the best games I've played in recent years have been uh, the Bioshock games. And certainly yeah. that's not stopping me every five minutes and asking if I want to buy you know, virtual cogs or whatever to... To buy new armor, it's, you, you, you just play through it, and clearly a lot of love's gone into making the games. Yeah. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the freemium has got its place, and certainly with uh, with the kind of because what with with digital stuff, uh, you know, whether it's music or or books on Kindles or games on mm. phones and tablets, we're kind of moving into this kind of post scarcity kind of thing so having something doesn't mean that you're stopping somebody else from having it so it's yeah uh, i think people are, are getting more and more like you said are more and more used to not paying for things yeah. so it's i guess there has to be a balance between how to continue being able to make these things and make good things against you know people not being willing to pay so i suppose you have to make the stuff that people pay for really good or you have to yeah, make the stuff that's I mean, free pay for itself by having people buy things within it by putting up these kind of little paywalls in it. But some, similarly, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negativity towards free to play in the sort of traditional games industry, right? Like lots of people who work on uh, you know traditional console games, like myself included, at one point will be very anti anti free to play, and they'll think it's you know just manipulative and horrible and whatnot. Um, and but. You know, I think some people think that you just plug free to play into your game and all of a sudden, you know, all the money starts rolling in. And that's not the case. What free to play means in a way is that people will download your game for nothing um, and and they will expect to download it for nothing, um, you know. a, a while ago, a few years ago, if you looked on the iTunes store at the, you know, the most popular, you, you tried to look for the best free games, you know, everything there was, you know, not very good. Mm-hmm. Whereas now there's like really good stuff available for free, you know, but, but you're going to, so people are going to download these things for free and expect to, and then they're going to play them. And if if it's not good within that initial one minute or whatever, yeah. They'll just drop it and they'll delete it from their phone, you know. So this this stuff you can't just plug free to play in and watch the money roll in. You still need to make something that compels people to to keep playing and, and enjoy themselves, you know. Yeah. There's I I've been playing um I've been playing running with friends a lot um and it's great, you know. It's a good game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's enjoyable. It's really socially structured, so you challenge your friends to matches. And I've been playing with loads of my pals, and you know, it's great. And you know, you can play it. You can be good at it, and and play it without spending money. I mean, even some of the most mercenary 
games you can still not mercenary some some of the the games that people have complained about mm-hmm. charging for you know charging lots of money for like sort of unreasonable things you can you know you can still complete them without you know without paying any money yeah absolutely. it's just you know it's it's well, I think it's a kind of uh, I think part of it's if you've got the patience to do it you can complete it uh, I think a lot of people are going to be quite impatient for the quick fix to get it, you know, to get to the next level as quickly as possible and then finish it and go on to the next thing. I think maybe we're kind of slightly oversaturated uh, in society with so much information that there's almost an addiction to getting, sucking it all in and not missing yeah. anything. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, you kind of reach the point where, I mean, I read a lot and I kind of find myself wishing that I could just download the whole book into my head in one go. So I can yeah. then read the next book because I want to know what's in that book, and then I want to know what's that one. And I suppose it's almost that with games. You know, you enjoy playing through it, but part of you is going, "Oh, I want to see what the end is." You know, it's uh, yeah. I think maybe there's a there's a kind of impatience that we've we've developed as a society that uh, I, I think it's kind of as we're trying to catch up yeah. as a species with ready availability of information. We're kind of stumbling a little bit and getting a bit wrong. Um, yeah, I think I think there's maybe this sort of misconception that sometimes the goal is the important thing, yeah. like the the bit at the end of something is the important bit. Not not to come across all sort of Zen and New Agey, but you know, certainly my thoughts on stuff like, you know, like being in a band or whatever is that the you know, the good bit is the get you know, the reason you play five a side on football on a Tuesday night isn't to become a professional football player or something. It's you know, doing it. Doing it is good. You know, yes. in, in the moment of doing it is fun, you know, and you know, maybe that applies to maybe that applies to games, maybe that applies to music or other things, but you know, just doing it and getting good at it should be fun. Yeah. And I'm sure and you know, I believe that in game design as well, you know, that you know, you play Mario sixty four and you just run around and it's fun. You know, you don't need to get to the end of the game to enjoy it. You can just you can just run around and not do anything and enjoy it. You know, like being on a I don't know uh, being on a skateboard or something, yeah. you know, it's just fun just doing it. I think that seems like an extremely positive point to draw the show to a close. Okay. Um, if people are looking to find anything out more about what you're doing, Fraser, where would they look online to find information? Would it just be a case of dropping you a line at an email address or something? Um, yeah, I've... Well, let me think. Um, I've got, like, a Tumblr that's just... Um, that's just frsr.tumblr.com. And it's just got some photos on it and stuff, that's all. But, you know, like, you know, it, um, let me think. Um, yeah, or just FraserLato at gmail.com, I suppose, if somebody wants to email or something. Not that I've got anything interesting to say to anyone. Well, um, I, I can but, hope that you'll get some of that music out and about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, me too. I mean, I've got to hear what you're doing. Yeah, I've got some, I've got some th- things that... Um, yeah, I sh- shouldn't say anything about, it. and that and that's not because I'm being secretive and like, yeah, I'm not announcing it yet. It's because like, you know, maybe some of the people involved haven't <laughs> really totally signed up to this yet, and I'm like, I don't want to go. Yeah, I'm doing this with this guy and this guy. You've got you some know? work going with people. Because um, not not yet. I'm sort of getting a. a group of songs together and trying to get them finished in order that some of us, a, a, a few people can start playing them together and stuff like that, but who knows if that'll ever happen, you know um, you know I if nothing else, it's a kick up the arse to get me to finish these songs Absolutely. As well. and, as, and as we've ascertained already the journey is the important part yeah, yeah, it's totally. totally the arrival totally. Yeah. Yeah. Fraser, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, The podcast will be up fairly shortly online. Uh, So, yeah, I guess um, all that's left to say is thank you for coming on. uh, And I'll hope to speak to you again at some point in the future because I'm sure there'll be other things that come up. Uh, You've been a fantastic guest. And uh, yeah, I guess all that's left to say is goodbye. Bye 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 bye. Thank you.